Hi, this is Nicole Alsacker. I will be doing a audio supported PowerPoint for chapter 23, Abdomen. So you guys should have your packets and be following along with your packets and your slides as I'll be covering a, a majority of this along with um, reading your book. Um, so just starting off with abdomen, you're, um, just remember basic anatomy and where the organs fall. And I'm talking about like major organs. So like in the right upper quadrant, what would like be a major organ up there? So that'd be the liver. Um, typically you may not be able to feel the liver in like 50% of people, but um, in lab we're going to go ahead and try to feel each other's liver border. Um, the spleen would be in the left upper quadrant. And again, typically not palpable unless it is enlarged. Um, examples for that would be obviously if there was a tumor, some type of mass. Um, sometimes in mono, um, a spleen can be enlarged. So again, just major organs and kind of where they fall into each quadrant. Um, as always, we move into subjective data next. And again, these are just some of the questions and um, things that you can um, ask the patient, again, what is their typical appetite, um, what, are, what have they been eating now if there has been a, a decrease. Um, dysphagia is, again, trouble swallowing. Food intolerances, again, that would be like a gluten or dairy, um, those type of intolerances. Um, finding out about the pain, and again, you can use cold spa for um, any type of pain or any type of nausea and vomiting, like when it's occurring after certain foods, certain times of the day. Again, what are their typical bowel habits um, and what's been going on recently? Um, and you can just kind of go through the list and um, think of questions for there. Also, if you look in your book in the subjective section, it gives you examples under each. Um, after you um, kind of ask what brings them in and kind of a little bit about them, again, their past um, medical and health history. So have they ever had surgery? Do they have any diagnosed GI diseases? Um, and again, GI could be anything from, you know, peptic ulcers to GERD to like an IBS or Crohn's. They could have had something as simple as like, I've had my gallbladder removed or an appendicitis. Um, they could have had a colon resection. Also, don't forget things like UTI, kidney stones, um, hepatitis A, B, um, all of those things, cirrhosis of the liver. All of that kind of falls under our GI um, di um, disorders and diseases. Then again, go into family health history. Again, trying to look more for like any type of genetic or um, familial type traits. And also finding out who is nutritional, uh, who is responsible for the nutrition in the family. So again, if you're teaching a patient about celiac disease and avoiding gluten and you go through some of the foods and then you find out that, you know, his, his wife does all the shopping and the food preparation, you want to make sure that she's involved in the conversation as well. Um, we always talk about our aging adult in each chapter. So again, I just kind of picked kind of a common um, trouble that aging adults um, have. I'm sure we all know of one or two elderly that will complain of their bowels or constipation. And again, if you look at the list, like they have a lot of strikes against them that could lead them to some constipation. You know, how many, ask yourself, how many elderly do you know that have a decreased physical activity, that have, you know, don't drink enough water? When I talk about a low fiber diet, just kind of think about what's cheaper. If you go buy fresh fruits and vegetables or processed and canned um, type foods, those are typically lower in fiber. Um, typically they are um, on many medications, so they have side effects from medications, um, bowel obstruction. And again, when we talk about like a bowel obstruction, we're also like thinking of any type of surgeries, um, scar tissue um, can cause adhesions and can cause trouble in our bowels as well. And obviously inadequate toileting facilities, um, if they have trouble getting to the bathroom, they may be, you know, holding it and again can lead to constipation. So once we've collected our subjective data, we're going to um, move into objective data. And there's just a few things you want to make sure before you get started. Um, again, don't uh, please remember hand hygiene and safety of the patient, um, good body mechanics, you know, if they are laying in bed, raising the bed up. 
Um, having an empty bladder um, for the patient helps um, that way then if you're palpating the abdomen, you're not palpating a full bladder. Um, a, and then just exposing the area that you're assessing. Um, again, they'll be supine, and we typically have them keep their arms at their sides. If you put their arms kind of above their head, it t tightens the um, abdominal wall. So if you, um, as you're sitting here, put your arms up, you'll feel that tightening. So we usually keep the arms at the side. So again, we typically start with inspection, and the order for a GI assessment would be, we always start with inspection, but then we're going to move to auscultation, then we're going to percuss, and then we're going to palpate. And we palpate last because if they're having any pain, we want to palpate and um, kind of assess that pain last. If you start with palpation and you cause them pain, um, they may just tell you, please stop assessing me, I'm in pain, you know, just stop, and then you, you haven't finished your assessment. So inspect, auscultate, percuss, and then palpate. So when you're inspecting, these are the things you're looking for. You're obviously going to look at the coloration of the skin. The abdomen's a good spot to check for overall skin color because it's usually protected from the sun. You're going to note for any striae, and striae is also known as stretch marks. They're typically like kind of silver, grayish white. Um, they're linear. It's when the elastic fibers of the skin have been broken after rapid or prolonged stretching. Um, seen in pregnancy and weight gain. Um, typically, older striae are again the silvery white, and recent striae are kind of pink, maybe like a purplish, um, and in color, and then they turn that silver white gray color. We're looking for lesions and scars, rashes and moles. Again, scars, we want to be alerted to any type of surgical scars because it could um, present in some underlying adhesions or excessive fibrous tissue, so we want to be aware of that. You're going to look at the abdominal symmetry, and again, that's easiest if you get um, kind of level with them and kind of go at it from their side, and you're looking for any um, masses, tumors, um, hernias, things like that. You can look for aortic pulsations, and we'll do that in lab, and you're going to look right at the umbilical area. And occasionally you can um, see any peristaltic waves. Typically not seen. Um, I've only seen it a few times on very thin people that were having like diarrhea and things like that. You might see some peristaltic waves. And then inspect the umbilicus. We want to make sure that it's midline. Um, this is a popular area for piercings, so we want to make sure that you know if it's clean, um, if there's any piercings, that the skin is intact. Also, if you want to know if it is inverted or if they have, um, I forget the word, but like an Audi um, belly button, and you want to ask if that's normal. If I've always had um, an any type belly button, also now I have an Audi, that would be an abnormal finding. So always just kind of ask and find out. So you should be able to fill in these. They're straight from your book. Um, all right, so these come straight from your book, like I said, and we're just gonna go ahead and kind of label these. So this first one here um, would be would be um, flat, and again, you like to look from the side to assess this. This one is known as scaphoid. Um, this one right here is rounded and that one is protuberant and the scaphoid and the protuberant could be our abnormals um, with scaphoid meaning a possible um, malnutrition, anorexia, things like that. Again, not always, just it could be. And then the protuberant one here, um, the distended one, could also be our abnormal. And again, we're seeing if the abdomen is symmetrical. We're looking for mal uh, masses, hernias, bulges. Next, after we've inspected, we're moving to auscultation. So grab your stethoscopes, and we're listening for bowel sounds and for vascular sounds. We do this before we percuss and palpate, because percussion and palpation can increase peristalsis and it's going to give us a false interpretation of bowel sounds. You know, one might have active bowel sounds, but you start pushing and palpating on the belly, and now we think they have hyperactive bowel sounds, but in fact that was just you. 
We use the diaphragm of the stethoscope because they're high pitched. And again, just lightly hold it against the skin. Again, you don't want to push too hard. And we always start in the right lower quadrant because that's where our ileocecal valve is. And typically bowel sounds are always heard here. You want to be very systematic, um, as I've talked about when we talked about like thorax, um, where we use like the ladder method to listen to lung sounds. Well, in the abdomen, you're going to start in the right lower quadrant. You're going to move up to the right upper quadrant. You're going to move across to the left upper quadrant, and then you're going to end at the left lower. So basically, you're following the colon. Okay, you're following the passage of things out. Um, that's the method we're going to use. We're going to use the same method when we um, palpate. All right, when you're listening to bowel sounds, you're just noticing the character and frequency. Um, and the bowel sounds come from movement of air and fluid through the small intestines. They're usually high pitched, there's a gurgling sound. We do not count them. You don't start in the right lower quadrant quadrant and then you know count how many little gurgle sounds you just kind of have to get a feel for it so if you just hear one maybe two sounds and that's it um, in the quadrant you could go with hypoactive if you're hearing you know kind of a normal little gurgle that's my little bowel sound um, side effect for you um, that would be active and I think we have all heard hyperactive bowel sounds at some point in our lives maybe you've had some bad Chinese or Mexican food, and all of a sudden you hear your stomach do the boo 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 boo. Okay, we're gonna call that hyperactive. Um, a perfectly silent abdomen um, is uncommon. You must listen for five minutes in each quadrant before deciding if bowel sounds are completely absent. While you're listening to bowel sounds, you can easily um, listen to vascular sounds. Um, and you're, again, we're listening for bruises. If you remember back in the cardiac section when we listened to our carotids, we used the bell of our stethoscope. Well, here on the abdomen, we're listening to, um, you can listen over the aorta. Um, typically, we don't hear anything, so when you switch over, and I do it as I'm listening to bowel sounds. So again, we start in the right lower quadrant. We're listening to bowel sounds. We're using the diaphragm. We move up to the right upper, again, listening for bowel sounds. And then halfway over, before we get to the left upper quadrant, stop here to the aorta, flip to the bell of your stethoscope, and see if you hear any type of brewery. Typically, again, you won't. You then move on to the left upper quadrant, back to the diaphragm, listening to bowel sounds, and then finish off. Once you've listened, you're going to move on to percussion. And again, the two sounds that are typical in the abdomen for percussion are timpani and dullness. Um, timpani, again, if you percuss lightly in all four quadrants, um, you're going to hear this timpani sound um, because air um, in the intestines kind of rise to the surface when the person's laying supine. Again, dullness would be over um, liver, the spleen, any type of organ. Also, too, if someone would be um, constipated um, or have an impaction or anything like that, you're going to hear dullness over that area as well. Then you can move to palpation, and again, start with just light palpation. So that's the same light palpation we used in thorax. So just a couple of fingers close tight together. We're gonna to push down about a centimeter in a gentle, like circular motion. Again, starting in the right lower quadrant and moving them around. We are not looking for organs um, or masses. We're just looking for an overall impression of the skin and just looking at the like musculature um, of the abdomen. Um, and also, like I'll watch the patient to see if they have any pain, if they have facial grimacing, if you notice their abdomen tighten up because it's painful. You can also um, lightly palpate the um, bilicus, and again, looking for any like bulges or um, masses. You can move on to deep palpation, and again, you're going to be pushing down about one to two inches. Um, and this is where we're typically feeling for like tumors, organs, um, when you palpate the liver, that would be deep palpation. If you're trying to palpate the spleen, again, that would be deep palpation. 
Um, just briefly going over anatomy again, the liver, as we talked about at the first slide, the right upper quadrant, spleen, left upper quadrant, and the bladder only if it's distended and it's going to be kind of in that supra um, pubic area of the body. So there are a few um, specialty tests that you can um, do as nurses. So if you think someone might have ascites, and again that's where they have some free fluid in the peritoneal cavity, and their abdomen's distended, they have bulging flanks, you have a, an umbilicus that's protruding, um, you can try to figure out if that is caused from ascites, which would be fluid, or um, if it's kind of a distension from gas. Um, two tests you could do is the fluid wave test and the shifting dullness. The shifting dullness is, um, as it kind of um, talks about it in the slides, the patient lays supine and you're going to percuss over the abdomen. Um, if you start at the kind of the outer circle, you're going to percuss and it's going to be dull and then you're going to move up towards the belly button and you're going to cha notice a change to a timpani sound. You then have them roll on their side and do it again. Um, this is probably easiest done um, when I should do a quick review in class next week. Um, I can demonstrate these, but um, typically with fluid in the abdomen, um, when you get to the belly button, that's usually like a little pocket of air, so your sound's going to change from a dull sound over the fluid to like a timpani sound because you're now you're over kind of an air bubble. When the person rolls to their side, what happens to all that fluid? The fluid kind of goes with them on their side, and now your air bubble is going to be at, at the top like side of it, and so you can kind of percuss around and see where the fluid's shifting. You can also do the fluid wave test, so the patient lays supine. And the patient actually kind of has to help you with this one. So the patient's going to put their hand straight down um, their abdomen, like um, along their belly button. And then so like if this was the abdomen, this is their belly button, the patient puts their hand right here. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to put one hand here and push down. And then with this hand, you come in and you tap. And you're just going to see if you can produce a wave that your other hand feels. So it's kind of like throwing a rock into a pond. You know how you get that wave, that ripple effect? That's what we're feeling for. If the patient has fluid in their abdomen, the, it will transmit the, uh, the fluid wave from tapping of your hand on one side to the other side, and you'll feel that. Again, I can demonstrate these when we are in class together next week. All right, there's a couple of special tests for um, the abdomen that you can do. Um, so we just talked about um, shifting dullness and fluid wave, and that was for ascites. Um, so if the patient has some abdominal irritation like a peritonitis, you can do a rebound tenderness. Um, so you push down at a 90 degree um, angle and you push slowly and deeply. Um, into their abdomen and then you quickly release. If they have pain on release, that's a positive um, rebound tenderness. You can also do some tests for appendicitis and that is um, referred rebound tenderness and again you're going to push down in the left lower quadrant and they will have pain on their right lower quadrant during you pushing down. The psoas sign is where you are going to have them lay on their side and they will hyperextend their right leg back and you will kind of push against their thigh as they try to bring it to midline and that will cause um, pain and discomfort. The obturator sign is where you're going to flex their right knee and rotate kind of their hip in and out and again that will cause them sign. The psoas sign and the obturator sign, um, when we move those that leg around, it's only the right leg that we care about because it's closely related to the location of the appendix. Uh, the last test that I'm going to talk about is the Murphy sign, and that's for someone who has a cholecystitis. So again, cholecystitis would be our gallbladder. 
So you're going to press your fingertips um, deep kind of um, under the right um, costal ridge, um, so kind of right underneath that rib cage, kind of under the liver border, and you're going to ask the client to inhale deeply, and they will have an ab abnorm the abnormality um, finding would be that they have sharp pain that basically causes them to like catch, like hold their breath. It like takes their breath away. And that's a positive Murphy sign. And again, we you get to do some of these in lab, and then I will re review and demonstrate these as well in class, and hopefully um, that will kind of help you understand the different tests. But they're all in your book. Um, feel free to look on like YouTube for little videos um, for the different tests. You will need to know the test, the Murphy sign, the obturator sign, the sosis sign, um, the rebound tenderness, the referred rebound tenderness, the fluid wave, and the shifting dullness. So again, make sure you're keeping up on your readings. Um, be prepared for lab, making sure you're looking at the abnormal findings that we do um, in lab and going over the slides. If you guys have any questions, I hope that you wrote them down along the way, and I'd be happy to answer them next time we see each other in class.